And much of what we practice with is feeling. <clears throat> Being one who feels. So in the normal English use of that word really covers you know, three three Pali words, Vedana, the quality of pleasure or pain, which is technically that's feeling. And then sanya, impression, perception, the way something is registered, what something means to us, how something seems beautiful or charming or repulsive or tasty, you know, perceptions. And then sanya, those two go together, the mind. And sankara, <clears throat> almost untranslatable, but you know, you can have it as either activities, which is a general impulse, reaction, response that happens, or formations, which refers to, in particular, habitual patterns that get established that become quite solid, mm. you know, and. So just looking at Sankara as volition, as impulse, well, it's, that's often seen as the leader, Chaitanya, volition. Something touches us, we're moved and we respond. We're delighted, we're depressed, we're you know, angry, whatever. You know, so something, but the contact, impression, feeling, perception, feeling, and then volition. <clears throat> So often, you know, just working with that in the body, because in the body it's relatively straightforward. It's not psychological complexities, just the quality of discomfort. Yeah. Or just the feeling energy is stale or stiff. And that you can feel quite, the impression can be of the, the impression, perception, can feel threatened, trapped, stuck, rigid, forced, or worn out, collapsed, can't make it, and then your mind can create all kinds of intentions and inclinations around that, can't it? You know, can't stand it another minute. Uh, <laughs> Quite a lot of it's just not very pleasant, is it? <laughs> I didn't sit here kind of bathed in pleasant physical feeling. <laughs> it's just either kind of manageably okay or, you know. But you contemplate it because really feeling is just the way it is. It's what the nervous system does and all you can really do with it is meet that and and uh, not f- turn it into hindrances. Mm. Agitation, restlessness, impatience, depression. You know, not, not turn difficult or uncomfortable feeling into hindrances that then saturate the mind and, you know, he was feeling hopeless. <clears throat> Doubt, hopelessness. <laughs> So if you get that, that physical feeling is pretty direct and easy in some ways. Not comfortable, but it's, you know, it's clear. Then you look at or begin to open up to mental feeling, which is much more powerful, continual, uh, intrusive, seductive, mm and becomes very much me, mental feeling, or the whole area, of the feeling area. There's a quality of pleasant, unpleasant perceptions in mental impressions we have, and then the volitions, the intentions, the inclinations that jump up around that, and they start to generate formations, you know, which become me. 
you know, me as uh, someone who can't meditate, me as someone who's this, me as someone who's, you know, always this way or that way. And the way it becomes true that when you get difficult mental feeling perception generates these psychological inclinations that really become me, you know, because they've been happening so long. And they're, they're strongly felt. Mm. Yeah, so we meet this and we... You know, just live in community. What the formations that come up with that? You know, I mean... A, good sense of fellowship or you know things aren't quite going too well or somebody's not fitting in very well and you get this sense of irritation or disappointment or frustration you know those are the impressions and perceptions and inclinations that come out of just something snagging something jarring unpleasant mental feeling you know, somebody's not turning up for their chores or small things, really. Look into the world, world news, you get, you know, horror horror stories in all parts of the planet, people killing each other, violence, you know, destruction. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah, unpleasant feeling, perception, humanity's a complete disaster, uh, Tender inclination, oh, I can't do anything about it, frustration, depression. So <clears throat> volition doesn't necessarily translate into, into physical action or verbal action. Often it just sticks there as this formed, formate, formed sense, a formation, where the mind is actually forming a negative impression, a sense of frustration or hopelessness or panic. Mm. That's a mental formation. Mm-hmm. And then as that stays there, you know, it becomes like a like a groove that your mind can run down any particular you know, it becomes a pattern. So it does become an activity becomes a formation. Just the way that a river carves a valley and then whenever rain falls it's gonna run down that valley and cut it even deeper. This is the way that Sankara activities become formations that encourage more of that same thing, something else to get, you know, excited about or depressed about or complain about or find fault with or have a great idea about, you know, oh, I'm going to do this, yeah, 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 you know. These kind of things that happen. Mm. So, you know, this is the whole area, isn't it? So is really what our lives are about in many ways. And then, you know, trying to not translate it into hindrances, so at least contemplate the movement of feeling happy, feeling sad, some sense of agitation, you know, keyed up bored, you know, so it doesn't really get deeply, and you contemplate it. Mm. Who is this? How can you be with this? How do you meet this? How do you open up to this? How do you work with this? Well, a lot of the hindrances teach us about the enlightenment factors, the bojanga, mm-hmm. mindfulness, investigation, Energy, piti, joy, rapture, uplifted, buoyant quality, pasati, uh, tranquility, samadhi, concentration, and um, equanimity, peka. And the first three are the, probably the key ones, because those ones you do, you don't really do samadhi, samadhi happens, so you get the first three of what you do 
the last three are the result, you know, calm, concentrated, equanimous. And this, the middle one, rapture, is just at the hinge point when what you're doing begins to give you a, a feeling of joy, a feeling of, oh yeah, this could work. Yeah, I get it. You know, all oh, right, a little bit lifted up. That's that's the pivot. Hmm? So and you want to kind of find your way to that pivot point because until you get that sense of, this is what's really, you know, meditation in one, one level of it, in terms of just clearing hindrances and internalizing to the point when you start to feel that the quality of energy and application and inspiration and enthusiasm in your practice is actually starting to pay off. You know, you've begun to light a fire. You've had damp wood and matches that keep snapping. But now finally, you've got one match that lights. <laughs> wow, look at that. You can't cut a fire, but at least you can think you could start a fire because you've got that one little... Oh, look, it works, you know. <laughs> and that's that, that kind of a moment of it. And then, it, hey, it happened again, you know. And gradually that little fl- flame starts kindling. Till that, you don't really see that, f- that, you don't really know, deeply know yourself, that these patterns could change, that we can actually come out of this cycle of feeling, impression, Mental formation. You know? That is, you know, if I'm feeling, you know, fed up, had enough, all I can do really is maybe, you know, go for a walk, have a cup of coffee, have a chat with somebody, do something to get me out of it. You know? I can't transform it. <clears throat> I'm not saying these things are wrong. You know, it's, it don't, you don't want to sit around just feeling totally miserable all the time. But there comes a time when, you know, you can actually turn it around rather than have to substitute. Mm-hmm. Rather than take a day off, you know, rather than have a break. You can turn it around. That's because the first three factors have become ripe enough, strong enough to meet the mental inclination, the mental attitude, the mental formation, and check it, stop. Hmm? Stop that movement, the mental movement of, oh, I can't do this, I'll never do this, or I've got so much to do, I've really got to get going, I'm in a hurry, or oh, I've got this great idea, I could do this and the other, other." or it's never going to work for me after all. You know, that's that's the that's the runaway train. And when you get those three three factors, mindfulness, investigation, and energy, they just stop, <laughs> stop the train. <laughs> yeah, and it's not like a, a negative stop. It's just no, you got this. You're not just that that movement of the mind. You've also got this quality. What do you call it? It means your basically your mental awareness has become strong enough, become enriched with mindfulness and investigation. So it hang on, no, that's just that. Stop. It doesn't partake of the mood, the mental formation. It doesn't partake of it, it doesn't participate in it. I mean re- that and you check it and then with investigation so you're mindful you're investigating actually what what is that underneath all the you know the I am's and this place and people and the world and so forth underneath it's the there's the mental impre- there's the impression you know perception of can't manage can't do or so much, being overwhelmed. It just gets quite simple. We go from overwhelm to underwhelm. <laughs> overwhelm is too much. 
can't say, yeah, it's just loaded. Underwhelmed is not enough. I feel empty, I feel vacuous. Uh, give me something to, you know, get going on. You know, and these really kind of very, uh, I mean, there all kinds of other things on top of that, you know, images that we have of how how we are, how life could be, or how people are, or how they're not, whatever. But, you know, often the, you know, why it gets us is because we feel flooded by these impressions. And when you're mindful, investigate, you're not flooded. You have them, well, at least I do. But, wait a minute, what's that like? And then just stopping, checking, and breathing through, walking through, standing with, softening. It's it's a kind of way that when you're more fully aware, awareness has got its own responsiveness, it seems to me. You just have to maybe suggest Something like, we'll just be with that a little bit longer, just be a bit wider with that, be a bit more open with that, or be a bit more firm with that, just some suggestion. And then your your awareness begins to, it's okay. Yeah, okay, I can be with that. Yeah, it's okay. And you begin to feel, when you've turned it, when you've stopped following it, things start to trickle in. And you begin to feel a quality of lightness or ease or presence and buoyancy. And then this is where the the rapture comes from that. The joy comes from that. Just the joy comes, the rapture comes when these difficult patterns, these quite strongly ingrained patterns, these very me patterns that I've been with for years now, start to unravel and turn around. You know? And there's a humor, warmth. Mm. It's turning, turning rubbish into gold. <clears throat> you know, and things like words like rapture sounds really ecstatic. And I guess it can be ecstatic, you know, depending on intensities. But I would say the basic, my experience, the basic feeling of is instead of having to keep pushing your boat, something, the water comes in and lifts it. Hey, oh, it lifts by itself. Yeah. So imagine you're trying to push your boat along a beach wet through wet sand and it's a struggle isn't it if you ever try to do that try to launch a boat and you're struggling pushing the thing through this wet sand and it won't you know struggle 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 and then the wave comes in and lifts it oh yeah <laughs> and it's certain things about it for a start it's not self it's not something i do but i can set up the conditions for it to happen so part of the joy of it is it's Something's almost meeting me, coming in. It's coming in and meeting me and lifting. And a feeling of that gives one the sense of relief. I don't have to keep trying to cheer myself up, but something comes and lifts. Mm. So important, that quality. This is what quite a lot of practice is about, trying to find channels to that. What faith and devotion and chanting and... Things of this nature, trying to lift the mind from its uh, wheel, its normal worldly wheel, inspiration, you know, confidence, uh, fellowship. These are all qualities that are there, things that are there to purpose of j- joy. So... Hmm. And when there is that quality of, of rapture, joy, pity, something you can settle and you begin to experience ease. It's okay. It's 
it's okay. Time stops, time slows down. Time is not pushing and it's not a burden. And the mind can unify. And samadhi, and a unified mind, sees things as they are, because they are as they are, and not any other way. It's equanimous, because it doesn't keep setting up the alternative of how it was, how it might be, if only. It's because the mind is unified, it doesn't do that. Therefore, it doesn't set up the base for a further wave of feeling and impression and volition. As long as there's something that could be another way, as long as the mind does that, then we're going to, oh, if only, we're going to be hankering for that pleasant experience, or we won't be dreading it. It could be another way. It will be another way. It was another way. I could make it another way. Then it sets up the basis for more of the volition, perceptions, impressions. So you can't have peace of equanimity. But of course it's the habit of the mind to set things up differently from how they are. You know, I feel sick, I want to be well. I feel tired, I want to get some rest. But we're looking more in terms, not so much of physical activity as mental, psychological activity. If I feel sick, I don't have to become a sick person. (laughs) I remain steady and I appropriately do the things I'm supposed to do when the body's like this, but I'm not a sick person. I'm not in there going, oh no, 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 what if happens, I'm dying, pain, misery, frustration, or these kinds of things. It's just, you're not a sick person, it's just a sick body. So that's the way the, the mind can then remain secure, because it doesn't create an alternative. That's what really the ongoing quality of samadhi is. The ongoing meaning of it is collected. Therefore one is equanimous. And yeah, sure, you know, there's things we need to do and so on. But internally, one's mind is, you know, I mean, I'm not saying this is a constant for me personally, but I can see that and I can touch that and so on and remind myself of it when it goes out of balance again. So the wave of feeling, impression and mental volition and mental formations, this is what we're finding, the stopping the ceasing. And when that ceases, our physical and verbal activities become clearer and just appropriate, responsive, caring, attentive. They're not flustered and flooded, not trying to make me into something. You know. This process of meeting feeling, meeting hindrance, meeting psychological mental formations, mental patterns, emotional patterns, is not something to, um, you know, be disappointed by, or I should be meditating. This is really what meditation prepares us for, or what, what concentration, or, you know, focusing using a system prepares us for. 
Because it's those patterns, those karmic patterns, those habits, those that rolling on, it's got a lot of juice in it, hasn't it? You know, the thing that keeps forming me has obviously got a huge amount of power and influence. Hmm? I don't see really just sidestepping it or belittling it as being, you know, something that's even doable or suitable. But can we transform it? Very direct, isn't it? So you have the different methods of or processes of uh, energy and effort one is one actually is just substitution you you're feeling this way therefore do this do an alternative yeah another is suppression just push it down stop it uh, another one is uh, investigation look into it calming it steadying it and then releasing but remember, substitution and suppression can only be temporary stop gaps to just avoid getting run over by that runaway train. So yeah, we can stop, check, go to this point, go to that point, stop, check, look the other way, forget about that, mm-hmm. yeah. take a break, yeah. something of this nature, just shift the mind out, and that's that's... Yeah, that's part of what we do. But it doesn't finally resolve anything. Because if you just do all that at a time, that's about all you learn to do. Things get uncomfortable, or go the other way. (laughs) You know, things get too attractive, you have to push away from it. And those qualities of the enticement of pleasure and the agitation around discomfort still remain as triggers. You just keep, you know, ducking. So transformation is another thing, looking into the roots of it. Hmm. It's, yeah, it's obviously it's not lightweight work. But uh, three particular aspects of what it seems to enhance presence, which is the aspect of here now steady presence. You know, you, you're not. You're settled. It's an energetic quality, quality of energy. It's not racing, it's not dragging back, it's not twitching. It's present. Mm -hmm. And another quality is the awareness, or we might call it awareness, which means you're clear, you have clarity, you're able to step back and, and see things, what's happening. Look at it. Your awareness is not fascinated. It's bright. Third is something, sense of responsiveness, compassion, sympathy, warm-heartedness. And these refer to the three... Um, Basis of sankara, the body sankara, the heart sankara, and the thinking sankara. They they seem to transform into the body just becomes a quality of presence, heart becomes a sense of warmth, openness, and the thinking mind just becomes clear and factual. It's this and not that. So these it's a transformation that occurs. Mm. Maybe we begin with the body. Mm. So when you 
feeling things, pushed by things, touched by things, tickled by things, stirred by something, you come into your body. How is that? Hmm. You might find it's very active in your face or your hands or your throat. You're coming down your body, you're relaxing your shoulders. You do it standing down into the ground, breathing, steady that quality of the movement of the breath. And that tendency for the, the activation to generate agitation or defensiveness or spinning, you check that. And we're not spinning, not defensive, not reaching out. You get grounded. And then that, that's where presence comes from. And we cultivate like that. So this is very helpful because there's no attitude with that. You don't have to have an attitude about it. You just keep referring to the body and come into the basic grounded body sense. You don't have to be that point specific, breathing out, breathing in, present. And this builds up to a tremendous, uh, really helpful here now strength. Strength is not aggressive, it's not force, it means, you know, the strength of a tree. It's not rushing around doing anything, but it's extre- extremely grounded and can support. You get tuned into that, you can feel the vitality of the body kind of steady and spread, and the mind enjoys that because it gives you, uh, gives the mind a sense of security and stability. You know, maybe this is why mindfulness of body is, is right there as basic introduction to meditation. Because you don't have to be brilliant, intelligent, you know, <laughs> body does it for you. You don't have to be in a good mood. You don't have to believe in anything, just coming into your body, grounding and feeling that tensing up. Sinking down, pulling up, tensing up, relaxing, you know, getting drawn into your eyes, coming down into your body, coming down into your feet. And a sense of presence that builds up with that. It's a kind of the first um, quality that checks the movement of feeling, of sankhara, of volition. And we do this a lot. You know, that's why you know training in monasteries is a lot of it. It's just about walking slowly, one step at a time, not running up down the stairs, putting things away. It's you're here now. You do things with a sense of that, just that, not jumping to the next moment. So awareness is the uh, clarity, and it's clarity that's not disgusted, ashamed, or fascinated. Just all it needs to do is know this is this. Can you can you give this a word? Can you give it a word? Can you give the feeling and the push a word? This is irritation. This is disappointment. Mm. This is hankering. <coughs> mm. Just give it a word. Yeah. And remember, if you can give it a word, you can be sure that it's pretty common, otherwise there wouldn't be a word for it. <laughs> if nobody else had it, there wouldn't be a word for it. <laughs> Which is kind of encouraging, isn't it? Because <laughs> it always feels so so me and so personal, and sometimes it kind of shouldn't Embarrassed shouldn't be this way. Well, it shouldn't be this way. There wouldn't be a word for it. If there's a word for it, it means everybody has it. (laughs) 
They just give it away. It's that. And it's not that. It's anxious. And it's not confident. Is it? And how's that? What's that doing? What's that anxious bit doing? You know, moving around, trying to come up with ideas, trying to come up with certainties. Anxious is this. Hmm? So just this, you know, it sounds so, in some ways very simple and also it seems to have no resolution to it, but actually knowing anxiety is this really knowing, 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 and knowing becomes bigger than the anxiety. And it's almost like the mental energy begins to shift from the anxiety to the knowing. And I went to see Umpur Da, who is this old, 90 years old monk. I think he was probably, he seemed like he was some kind of Aryan. He was certainly was a pretty beautiful monk, 90 years old, and chirpy, bright. I was with Ajahn Jayasara, and, he, and uh, they asked him, well, how should you meditate if you're the abbot? And he, he went, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> which, <laughs> which meant I think he probably thought it was probably pretty much, you know. And he said, "Well, whatever you do, be the knowing of it." That was his answer. He just said, "Whatever's happening, be the knowing of that." You keep doing that, the knowing gets brighter and brighter and brighter. No, that was it. That was he was a man of few words. But the few words he used were extremely, you know, obviously very deeply understood and felt. But the knowing, like, what's does that do? Because <laughs> you think knowing is just having an idea. No, knowing is a quality of presence, non-movement, non-alternative, not creation. It's what it is and what it's not. It's not a mental formation. It's not more thoughts and ideas. It's just the knowing. And it's the stopping of further thinking around it. And that that becomes clearer, more endowed, more steady. Well, this is, you know, is it, you haven't stopped and it just kind of drained the anxiety or the urgency or the drained into this quality of clarity. And that's also a source of joy. Mm-hmm. And warm-heartedness, how important it is to, you know, whatever we do, maintain that, ex- that sense of, may I be well, I mean, these are just words, but as if you are not, like your body doesn't lose its warmth, why should your heart lose its warmth? Your body doesn't lose its warmth. You know, you feel cold, but your body's still operating at that same temperature, isn't it, internally. And yet that's kind of what happens when you, you know, you get a lot of bad news, this, that, this, that, you just go, oh, jeez, fed up, you know, what's the point? Useless, you know, heart loses its warmth. We experience ourselves in a world or an environment of hopelessness. And this is this is what depression's like, you know. And this is quite common, very common, often in milder forms. People aren't actually, you know, having to take medication for it, but a lot of people are. Because if you do you know, <laughs> read the social context, yeah, the message comes across. <laughs> it's not unconditioned love out there. <laughs> yeah.
it's uh, you know you name it pollution war global warming crisis economic meltdown antagonism you know and so on and uh, terrorism and crime and people aren't going to you know that feeling of it's, nobody's going to look after you it's not out there so you have to keep moving against that into generating this quality of my body's still warm the breath is still warm breath is still flowing the awareness is there the presence is there that's all you're ever going to have really really you know the rest of it, who knows? You know, the rest of it you don't have a lot of say over. But breathing, body, awareness, that's all you've got, really. The rest of it's on loan. Why don't we make much of this? Much of what we already have and endowed with. Wrap ourselves in it. Wrap up well. <laughs> you know? Wrap up well in it. Wrap up in good intention. Wrap up in loving kindness. Wrap up in compassion. Wrap up in gladness. Appreciating the, your own good deeds. Wrap up well. It's stormy out there. And this, uh, you know kind of constant little reminder you know constant reminder to make sure you put your proper clothes on you know it's it's stormy out there so this means that you know when things are difficult rather than being the difficulty there's a heart that can respond to the difficulty when I'm having a bad day, rather than, you know, deepening into it and feeling miserable about it all, just you know, the responding to that. And that again is something that's uh, pretty much involuntary. Mm. It's not a decision. It becomes a natural intelligence of the heart. And... You know, when you think of it, well, my goodness, why shouldn't it? That's what it's there for. Who doesn't want their own well-being? But we get confused, you see. Because you had so many years of being told your well-being will come through buying one of these. Your well-being will come through going to this place. Your well-being will come through avoiding that thing. Your well-being will become if you stamp out all of those nasty things. Your well-being will come, you know, through forgetting about what you've already got and grabbing and fighting with the stuff out there. So when you get inducted into that, It's not going to come through getting rid of people we don't like, we don't feel comfortable with. It's not going to not going to happen. You know? It's not going to happen through getting rid of our own silly habits. But there's a, a transmutation whereby there's a shift through really remembering again and again. You know. Go after yourself. Quarrelling with people you don't like isn't going to give you a satisfactory result. Even being vindicated doesn't give you a satisfactory result. So we... What will is much more immediate than that. And this is why, of course, you know, we meditate... We're training ourselves in direct awareness, training ourselves to 
remember thing, something that we already have but we don't really notice it because it's not a sensation, it's not a volition, it's not a deliberate decision. Hmm? It's something that comes out of consciousness when volition, habitual volition, is checked. Consciousness, awareness, produces these signs of deliverance. Hmm? These signs of liberation. Consciousness, when it's begun to unhook from this sankara process, begins instead of just generating huge panoramas, opens into something more spacious and beautiful and grounded. Meet the feeling. You know, meet what nags, pushes, weighs, excites, ground in your body, name it, just that, clear, begin to respond to how it's affecting you. This is the path to joy. <clears throat>